Welcome back to another AP World History Lecture. Today we're going to be taking a look at the classical civilizations that are on the periphery of the major uh, empires that we saw in Eurasia. Um, so these are going to be uh, civilizations in the Americas and in Sub-Saharan Africa that we're prim primarily looking at today. And before we jump into things here, I want to talk just a little bit about kind of a comparison and why we don't spend much time on these versus the other ones. Uh, the big thing is the world population during this time period kind of peaks around 250 million people and roughly 80% of those people are in Eurasia. So where we should spend most of our time to talk about what, what most people are doing in the world is going to be those Eurasian empires. So Rome, Persia, uh, India, uh, and uh, East Asia with China. Now, the other reason why we don't necessarily talk about them is because the Americas and Africa uh, lack as as large of empires and with as lasting contributions as uh, what you see in these classical civilizations that we just looked at uh, over the last couple of weeks. That's not to say that these civilizations that come up don't have a lasting impact. The Maya have a huge impact in Mexico um, as well as Teotihuacan. The um, uh, Bantu, who we're going to see again, have a huge impact, but it's not as much as what we see with the um, with the Eurasian empires. And lastly, there's, there's just not a lot of information on these. Uh, the big thing is in the Americas, there's no consistent writing system. And um, there are some, like the Mayans have a good writing system, but if we talk about the Andean civilizations, they don't have writing systems. Um, and the North American civilizations, the Anasazi and Mound Builders we'll look at, don't have any writing system as well. So we have very limited resources to talk about them other than archaeological evidence. And some of these civilizations just disappeared because they couldn't build as permanent as structures as the Europeans can because, or not just the Europeans, but the Chinese and the Indians, because they don't have as, as large of draft animals, or they don't really have draft animals to help them with this. Uh, remember, when we looked at Unit 1, the only major domesticated animals that you have in the Americas are turkeys and alpacas, with llamas also in there with the alpacas. You can't carry much with a turkey or anything, and alpacas and llamas you can carry a little bit with, but uh, nothing too significant. It's not like people are riding into battle on alpacas. That would be interesting, but that's they're not the same as horses. They can't carry as much, can't do as much, so um, they're just not that reliable. And Africa, um, they're in constant contact with Eurasia, so they're constantly getting new things, new ideas, so they get the farming, they get animals, uh, they get the religions, but um, they don't... The geography is so varied and, and tough to work with at times that you don't see these huge empires. We're going to see a few um, here, basic or the starting civilizations, and we'll see a couple major empires when we get to Unit 3, but there's just not going to be a lot there yet. And also, writing in these areas is, is sparse at times. Um, so uh, we're going to take a look and talk about them as best we can, though. So. Starting off, we're going to look at Africa. There are three major regions we'll look at. Uh, there's West Africa with the foundation of um, what will be the major empires there with Genesia and O. Um, they'll set up the Mali, Ghana, and Songhai. We'll talk about those in Unit 3. Uh, there's the Bantu uh, regions in West to Central to East to South Africa. Um, you can see the states that come up with that, but really their, their ideas... Um, spread throughout all of, or most all of Sub-Saharan Africa. And then uh, we have Ethiopia uh, with the Aksum and Moro that we're going to take a look at. So first one we're going to look at are those from Ethiopia. Uh, Moro is the eldest of those, and uh, they are based on agriculture and herding. So that means not everyone is settled down. Uh, some are running around following their animals or getting their animals proper foods to survive. Now, uh, the big thing with them is they try to be kind of a copycat, although they do their own unique things. Uh, but they are copying the Egyptian civilization. We can see that in their architecture and some of their ideas and how they structure themselves. Um, their writing system is similar, uh, but it's also unique. They do their own little perspectives on things. You can see these tombs here uh, in the picture. Uh, they are very much based on the Egyptian pyramids. And uh, the designs are fairly Egyptian, but it's also different. It's not the same. Uh, much smaller scale. Uh, and slightly different designs that they've taken on. Their economy is primarily focused on trade, which is what we'll also see with the Oxum. Uh, both these groups uh, heavily trade, uh, and when trade goes away, uh, it's going to cause problems. Um, 
and so uh, they'll trade on the Nile uh, in Moreau and also get some Saharan trade. But around 100, uh, trade along the Nile is not going to be as significant because the Roman Empire has taken over uh, and they're using different trade routes that are more advantageous to them. And so it shifts away and that causes problems and they eventually collapse around 100. Although uh, we did see some signs of them starting to adopt Christianity. The Oxum, on the other hand, start right around that time, so they take advantage of that uh, vacuum that pops up. They base their agriculture more on just grains. There isn't as much um, uh, pastoralism in it, and their trade focuses on the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean instead of the Nile River, and this will work well for them until 940 CE when, well, uh, the trade shifts again, um, and as well, they can't hold on to their territories because of overexpansion, uh, and so they'll be pushed out uh, and taken over in, in large parts by the uh, Islamic conquests. But they also follow, they're, they're, they're a little bit more unique than the uh, Nubians or Moreau, uh, but they will also follow some of the ideas, um, cultural ideas of the Egyptians by building large obelisks. They are different than the Egyptian obelisks, but uh, that was a major uh, symbol of uh, the pharaoh's power, um, or just a, a major architectural feature, I should say, of the Egyptians. Um, fun fact with that, though, if you didn't know, uh, Rome stole many of those uh, obelisks, though, that the Egyptians used. And so now if you go to Rome, you can see more obelisks than you might go and see in, in Egypt um, in, in a very small area. So you can go see a lot of them there. Uh, Romans seem to, to, to like the idea of them. And uh, last major thing with the Oxum, and this is really their lasting achievement here, is that they adopt Christianity. And uh, in the region they're in, uh, which will become Ethiopia uh, today, that'll become the last bastion of Christianity until we get to uh, the modern imperialism of the Europeans and coming into uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, conquering the regions and forcing Christianity on the people. So this is the last major area of it. Uh, everything else will be kind of taken over by the uh, Islamic conquests and the Muslims after, um, after the 700s. So that's East Africa. In West Africa, we have Jene Geno, and this is uh, one of many city-states around at the time. Uh, they didn't fight with each other a lot. Instead, they focused more on trade, and uh, they have these specialized workers in each of them that uh, have been passing that down for generation to generation to generation. And unfortunately, if your father's a shoemaker, guess what? You're probably going to be a shoemaker. If your father does... Um, does textiles, does some type of tailoring or whatever, he, you're going to probably be doing that. It's, it's kind of like the uh, Indian caste system that we were talking about uh, when we looked at uh, India. Um, the one unique thing, though, is that the city-states aren't like what we're seeing in kind of Sumer or Egypt, or not Egypt, but Greece. Instead, they might be more similar to the Indus Valley, where there might not have been a lot of warfare between uh, the two, uh, or between the city-states, uh, because they want to focus on trade more. Uh, and if you have constant warfare going on, trade kind of goes by the wayside. And Jene Geno's lasting contribution is that they're going to be uh, one of the uh, founding parts of um, the major empires in this region known as Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, which will take advantage of the Trans-Saharan trade and will facilitate the spread of Islam throughout that region. And if you go to West Africa today, again, the prominent religion is still going to be um, Islam. Last major African group we're going to talk about here are the Bantu. We talked about them in Unit 1. We're going to talk about them here. We're going to talk about them pretty much up until the modern times. Uh, we, you can see their, their migration lasts until about 1700 CE, or they keep spreading out. Their ideas keep going around. So this takes a very long time. Uh, but they are hugely significant because they influence all of this territory. And so they migrate from Nigeria, they go to East Africa, they go to Central Africa, they eventually make their way to South Africa. And along the way, they spread three major things. Their language, which becomes a base for 400 languages today. Their farming, which was based on yams and raising cattle and sheep, which allows the population to grow. And ironworking, which gives them durable tools that allows them to take on other groups that might uh, try to attack them and fend them off more easily. Um, these are the three huge things you got to remember. And uh, a couple other things that you can note is that uh, within the culture of all these, uh, you see a common theme of uh, many uh, families or leadership and civilizations being uh, brought about around kinship, so families. And um, when you have a strong leader, whether it's a priest or a warrior or whatever, 
Um, you see the groups get uh, small groups start to get a little bit bigger and more powerful, but you don't have significant civilizations popping up here yet. Um, the exception to that is kind of East Africa, where we start to see some city-states along the coast that really play a major role in the trade in the region. But we're going to talk about those guys more um, next unit in Unit 3 when we look at the major trade routes. And uh, two final major things to note is the religions idea spread, which are mainly ancestor worship and, and um, uh, kind of spirit worship, uh, which isn't too much of a far cry for most of the regions that we talk about. Uh, outside of the the major Eurasian uh, empires, because uh, well, most of them don't have one of the major the five major religions that we have today, or the global religions. Uh, they have um, kind of more basic uh, religions, less developed or less um, ritualized uh, religions. And then last thing is they're less patriarchal. They they bring in some matriarchal concepts, but they're not. They're we can't say they're matriarchal by any means. They're they're still very patriarchal, but they give women some more rights. <laughs> now, uh, last one we'll look at it in this lecture is North America, where we have two major civilizations, the Anasazi, which are also known by the, as the Pueblo, uh, which is what they actually prefer to be called their ancestors, and uh, the Mississippian cultures of the mound builders, uh, which were centered around uh, Cahokia, but spread throughout uh, the Mississippi Valley and going to the East Coast. We'll first start in the Southwest United States, looking at the Pueblo, and uh, they were sent around uh, five major villages uh, that brought these people together. They lived in pit houses because, well, it's kind of like a desert there. It's not the, the best climate you can see based on where that city is. And so it's tough to farm there, but also it's going to be very, very hot. And so you want to dig into the ground where it's going to be cooler. And um, so they would build these pit houses. And uh, they then connected these villages by uh, really wide kind of super highways for back then that could connect them together for trade and communication. And we can also tell they had highly skilled astronomers because of how they designed their cities because it lined up with um, astronomical points. And then, um, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's difficult to farm here though. Uh, they are able to do it. Uh, they use some special techniques to make the sand or to make the sand, but make the, the dirt, the ground more fertile to be able to support it. Uh, however, once you get into bad environmental situations going on, like let's say a drought, uh, it's not going to take you very long to go, okay, we're going to be in trouble if this continues at all. Let's go find a new place to go and and make home because we're not going to be able to survive here because we can't get enough food. And that's what leads to the collapse of this civilization. So uh, they disappear. The people don't necessarily disappear, but this style of living here in these pueblos um, disappears. And then they go to a different, uh, they move around and we can still see um, some of their ancestors today, or some of their descendants today, I should say, not ancestors. Now, the other major civilization here in the Americas is the mound builders. Uh, they are agriculturally based, very similar to the Anasazi, although these lands are much better and more fertile. Uh, but even though they're more fertile, these some of these cities grow to be huge, and they can't supplement all that with just the farming. There's not a lot of protein in that diet, and so... Um, they have to do some farming and fishing to bring in enough food to actually support everyone. Uh, the largest of these center, city centers was known as Cahokia, and that's right outside modern-day St. Louis. And uh, within these, you can see clearly social classes. Um, although we can't see the towns specifically, we can see it through their um, burial mounds uh, and how people are buried, what they're buried with, where they're located in the burial, things like that. Um, and so... Um, that's a, a huge part, and that's why we know about their social classes. And um, that's also what they're most famous for. As you can tell, they're the mound builders. They built giant mounds of dirt that were then in designs of animals, or could be kind of a pyramid, as you see in Cahokia there. Um, but uh, they'd be in animals. And so you can see down here in the bottom right, uh, some mounds outlined in white in this black and white uh, photo. And this is of effigy mounds, which is here in Iowa. Uh, it's in northeast Iowa, and you can go visit it anytime. It's it's really cool park to go see and and to be a part of uh, and to see kind of the history of your that it with Native Americans uh, in Iowa. Uh, unfortunately, we can't go for a field trip there. That would be fun, but uh, we can't work that into our schedule right now. So, um, last thing to bring up with these guys is that uh, they had a vast trade network because they spanned over such a large uh, territory. They had a lot of trade. They could use the mount or not mountains, but the the rivers throughout the region uh, to help with trade. 
they could walk throughout the region. And so um, you have a, a very highly sophisticated trade network going on that would allow you to get uh, products from any coast that you wanted to. And so we see those kind of getting into Cohokia here. Uh, and we see those with the mounds uh, and the burials within those. And that's why we can see all these crops reaching this region, especially maize, which was from Mesoamerica, but it eventually gets pulled up and, and made into a useful crop here. And that's all we're going to take a look in this lecture. In the next one, we'll go a little bit south uh, and go to Mesoamerica, and then we'll look at the Andes.